Well, you know what's something? They made a lot of progress, and then the progress slowly got stolen back. Hmm. You know what I mean? You, Absolutely. You made a lot of cultural progress. People got a lot closer together than when I was a kid. Okay, like I was saying on the record, you know, at that time, the difference I see between the two times, the major difference in musically I saw was that in the last dystopia, when they were screaming apocalypse and dystopia and disaster, just like they are now, I thought the old one had a better soundtrack. Welcome back to Inner Sleeve here on Sound Mojo. It's episode number 23, joined by the usual suspects here on the line, Frank Pavan and Joe Pacheco. What's up, guys? You have a good long weekend? Awesome long weekend. Spoiled by the weather, spoiled by things to do, chores. But hey, man, we're here. We're smiling. Yeah. It's a good You day. know what's funny, Joe? You said spoiled by the weather. It was actually like... Um, good weather, though. It, right. it was good weather, but like at least here in Montreal, we were we were worried that there were chances of rain. Mm. And uh, remember, on over the weekend, anyways, I had a lot uh, of that yeah, here too good. in Alberta. So it, oh, yeah. you know, I I wasn't quite as spoiled, but I don't think we typically are in this region with weather, so it's sort of to be expected. Right, <laughs> right, right. And our weekly uh, sports roundup: obviously, the Oilers, Edmonton, they're out of the playoffs. They got swept. <laughs> That was a sad night, man. You're opening the wound over here, but yes, this is a fact. <laughs> I, tr yeah, I tried yeah. to watch, but you know, between the crack in my fingers last night, but uh, <laughs> to no Exa avail. Exactly, exactly. But uh, no, it was a good weekend overall. Went golfing, uh, golf seasons in full sprint. There in you full, go, uh, full swing. So, anyways, it was a good weekend. Hope uh, the viewers had a good weekend as well, having a good week as well. And uh, yeah, what are we going to be talking about today, boys? Well, hopefully something to make their week better. Um, definitely joined by a very special guest on today's episode. If you have been following the metal scene back into the 90s, even a little bit before, you're well familiar with Monster Magnet. And we have the mastermind behind the group himself joining us on the program today, Dave Windorf. Um, just a really cool, unique dude. I mean, just, you know, to open up just from talking with him, it seems like he's very genuine. He actually mentioned that he even forgot we were doing an interview until shortly before. So it wasn't scripted and rehearsed. And I just found from him, I feel like he's very candid and you can sort of trust what he says. I don't know what vibe you guys got from Dave. Pretty Joe, much. Pretty much similar yeah. vibe, like a uh, very straight up dude, like what you see is what you get, right? Kind of thing, you know, no, uh, even though it's very like hocus pocus, a lot of cool like uh, psychedelia stuff, right? But it's, um, he's a very simple guy, like I said, like like you said, actually. But what I, li I liked a lot of points he brought up, you know, like um, uh, with the similarities between like the music. Well, you guys had a discussion with the music of today in terms of all the riots and like the movements, civil rights. Movements Absolutely. And, and back then, that was an interesting point. That, that was a crazy point by him. And I mean, a, a lot of the music that he's getting ready to release and has been working on. Um, and, you know, it's funny that this has come up with other artists, too, that they find today's times a lot more reminiscent to the 60s, 70s era than they do to anything that's happened in between. And, and uh, you know, it was really fascinating getting into that because, you know, maybe by appearances, I might be giving it away. I wasn't around in the 70s. Okay. Um, so maybe contrary to the shirt, uh, <laughs> yeah. but I wasn't there. So, yeah, was really barely, fascinating. It was barely yeah. around. <laughs> The thing You're is, just... we had like, if you think about it, like we've had like sixty plus years to 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 idolize those iconic moments, right? They're always in movies, big speeches. So it's kind of like, you know, not to say you know use a bad word, but brainwash. But it's kind of like part of our thing, where it's like we idolize those things. And today we don't have enough removed distance yet from what happened and what how we're mm -hmm. going to reflect and see it in ten years, or twenty years. Mm -hmm. I can see that. Yeah, there's a lot of things that are still fresh. So th that sort of came up. Um, so yeah, lots of interesting discussion in this interview. But right before we jump into it, um, some more good news for music fans. There's been a new super group that has just been launched. Um, and this is not a super group for the faint of heart. Uh, it's called the LA Rats. And it's featuring Nikki Six, Rob Zombie, John Five and Tommy Clufedo's on drums, who was actually the fill-in drummer for Black Sabbath. He did their last couple of tours. Um, Joe, I don't know if you got to check out their single, but they did a cover of the classic "I've Been Everywhere" uh, yeah. by the Lucky Star singer. I did, and I was really impressed with uh, like when I first heard Ellie Rats. It kind of made sense when I saw who was in the band, right? Nikki Six of Molly Crew and and stuff, uh, and I kind of sort of like did the little bit of a really you know like what what's going on but when i saw rob zombie for some reason i said oh okay because it's did like that legitimize things for you for me yeah because i'm a big white zombie fan and then like i followed rob zombie and in general 
for I I can take his like you know the, him being a, a a movie maker a director and stuff so I, I kind of take his stuff and like it's always good right so I, I'll give it that that chance you know of listening to it and I listened to it today and uh, I love the intro man the intro was like he just it's it's he's speaking and it sounded so Frank Zappa ish I was mm. like wow this is so good you know. And then the rest of the song was once it came in and stuff, it felt more like a cover and, you know, just like, like a rock version of a country traveling uh, Western kind of song. Originally written by an Australian, but made famous. I, well, it did go famous. It got like number one in the charts. But I think a lot of people are familiar with the Johnny Cash version of it. Yes. Yeah, okay. definitely not a track that the original was a, was a massive hit, but really good take on that, Joe, because I agree. When I started listening to it, like... I also found as it progressed, I was like, I could sort of take or leave this. I wasn't clamoring for a version of this song. But at the same time, it's just like, if you don't like it, don't listen to it. And then they're they're going to come out with new stuff, hopefully original yeah. stuff. I mean, I, I would personally be a bit disappointed if they kept doing just covers. Um, but if they figure it out to bring some new Rob Zombie stuff to the table with some new Nikki Six bass... I'd be happy. So uh, definitely curious what the audience thinks. Leave us a comment. Will you be, li be listening to the LA Rats? Also, have you gotten into any of the new Monster Magnet music? We definitely want to know what you guys think. So we're not going to hold you any longer. We will be back after the pod, after the interview here to talk about the Billboard Awards because there's so much to discuss. But without further ado, here is our conversation with Dave Windorf, the mastermind behind Monster Magnet. Dave Windorf, th thanks so much for taking the time to join me on the show today. No problem, Cassie. It's my pleasure. Very cool. You know, to open it up with something a little off the cuff, and this is just sort of out of morbid curiosity for me. Uh, in the in the mid '90s, you actually appeared on Politically Incorrect with Bill Maher. I was I just did. curious. Yes, I was just curious. What was that experience like for you? And and can you tell us about that? It was insane, and I was so un so unprepared. I you know. I was much younger then, and I didn't understand the intensity of live television. It was live, mm. you know? Right. So I didn't know. I mean, I knew I knew what I was talking about, and I could hold a conversation, but I didn't realize they were going to be so evil. I mean, those people, they're hanging around the green room. My first time, okay. on, I think I was on Conan or something, mm -hmm. but just as a band, so I'd never been a, been a part of a panel. And everybody's hanging around the green room. And there's these old stars like Stacey Keats was this guy that used to play Mike Hammer on TV. And he was really mm -hmm. nice. You know, he's this older guy. And a couple of women, like political women, I didn't know exactly who they are. You could tell which one was Republican and which one was Democrat, you know, just by the way they dress and stuff. And everybody right. started chilling out. We're talking about anything else. And everybody was very cool. We get on and they turn into vipers. I mean, right. It was so quick. They were just at your neck, so to speak. They or they were at everybody's neck. It was a free-for-all, and they were really, really quick. And I was like, all right, either I could start babbling really, really quick here and make a fool out of myself or just shut up, pretend to be cool, and come up with the right answer at the end. <laughs> and, and that was the approach that you, you took? That's exactly what I did. I said, there's no way. I can't. I'm not going to practice verbal yeah. sparring with these experts. So I just stayed back there and tried to, you know, tried to be as cool as I could. Exactly. Uh, I got away with it. No, I think you carried but, yourself yeah. well because it, it's, it's very out of your element. Because like you said, on I guess on Conan, you guys were there to perform and you guys weren't being interviewed per se. No. And anytime I had been interviewed before, it was a traditional interview like this. Right. It wasn't put into the ring. Against other personalities. Uh, yeah, talking about stuff that more or less I didn't know what the hell I was talking about. I mean, I knew a little bit, but these people have been like studying the news all week. Right. Well, I was probably riding around in a tour bus, like studying girls, you know, that's what I was doing. <laughs> studying what's really important. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no doubt. You know, another thing I know about you is that you're very fond of comic books, always have been. There's some influence, especially like in the new lyric video that you put out. Uh, wow. Yeah, absolutely. Here at Watch Mojo, we obviously are known for our top 10 lists, and we did a list of the top 10 superhero movies of all time. But before we get into the wow. list, who's your favorite superhero? Can you pick one? Well, when I was a kid, it was Spider-Man because he was, he was the person that you could be. 
Yeah. Right. I mean, they really knocked it when they created Spider Man. Steve Ditko and Stan Lee created Spider Man. Notice how I said Steve Ditko first. They really got it, man. You know, they, they really got to the heart of like any kid that that concept can work anytime. Right. Nerd kid doesn't know what to say, gets superpowers. What does he do? He kind of blunders it in the beginning, tries to get money. You know, the first Spider Man, he goes out and tries to like be a star with him. Right. Wrestling in the movie. Hey, yeah. And wrestling in the movie. And it was wrestling in the comics too. And then he learns through tragedy, of course, mm -hmm. um, that he's got more to do. And uh, I could totally relate to that when I was a kid. I still can. Yeah. yeah. A great character. It really is a great character, probably the most relatable one. So that being said, do you think that that's the greatest superhero movie or do you have a different favorite movie? The movies are weird with me because I love the comic books so much. And I was reading the comic books before any of those movies came out. Right. That the legend and the lore is in the books. The movies, to me, the movies are for everyone, but the books were for me. Right. Back then, when I read comic books, and anybody anybody can agree with me before these movies came out, it was kind of like being a secret society. Mm. Like, not everybody read comic books. So if you were in school and somebody else read comic books, you knew about it, you talked to it, but you didn't talk to anybody else because, number one, they throw you out <laughs> for being a geek. Um, so I hold that to my heart, but I think my favorite comic book movie that's come out in the whole thing has been the Watchmen. I think the, the ah. Watchmen, and I know a lot of people give it, give it crap, but I think it's like more true to the original comic books. Very strange and cool, but they all have their good moments. Yeah, it's true. And it's hard to narrow it down also. On Watch Mojo, at number one came The Dark Knight, uh, number two, Superman from 78, and number three was right. Captain America Civil War 2016. That was pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah, it was. And and I like the um, the uh, Witcher Soldier one, too, because that was more like a spy mm. movie. You know? Right. I'm looking forward to seeing the Captain the Falcon, or, or the uh, Falcon, and who is it, Falcon and who? I'm the not sure, one. actually. I, I haven't seen the trailer quite yet. But it looks good. Um, I'm going to have to catch up on that one. I'm hoping these guys like really kind of stretch out with some of their concepts. And, you know, now that they made superheroes likable to everyone, I mean, never thought I'd see so many people going to see a superhero movie in my life. I mean, it was such a, an almost underground thing when I was a kid. For sure. I'd like to see them take some chances and take a little more, get a little more edgy with it and, uh, you know, really float some real science fiction concept. It'll blow some people's minds. It's about time. Definitely. Well, it's not like they don't have the technology, right? Oh, man, they have no excuse. Not if they have absolutely no excuse. No excuse. For not blowing us away every single time. I couldn't have yeah. said it better myself. You know, Dave, obviously Monster Magnet is known for the music in general, but one of the main things about the group is you guys' is live you talk about lore. I mean, the legacy you guys have made in terms of live shows and even you yourself is just, uh, you know, incredible. When you think back to all the shows you've done, is there any moment that you're like, this was my favorite so far, or this was the best it's ever felt so far for me? Yeah, there, there is. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of moments because I mean, playing live, first I got to explain playing live is like nothing else. And anybody who plays live knows it. Every day is the first day. Hmm. It's not like being in a TV show or writing. You really have to be in it. And you're not only in it, <coughs> you're not only in it, but the audience is in it too. So it's, you never really get used to it. It's very, right. they don't call it live for nothing. It's a lie. <laughs> We're playing in Germany and this is like a million years ago. I can't remember when, but sometime more towards the beginning than towards the end. And it's often this weird little spot deep in the forest um, not too many years after the wall came down and they had these strange festivals there was no security nothing just a lot of people having a good time and we were do doing a song called spine of god which is like a real um trippy uh song and uh it's very very trippy it's kind of evil and at one point the guy in the song that would be me uh sings declares himself the center of the universe Mm -hmm. That's in the song. In the song, the singer is like, I'm the center of the universe. Um, you know, it's like it's like Dr. Doom or, or, or Thanos or somebody. Right. And right at the point where I said that, and I'm not lying here, 
the sky opened up with a crack of thunder and a, and a, a bolt of lightning. Wow. That was a big, total summertime, huge surprise crack Holy. of lightning, which happens back, you know, it happens in, in storms. And it was right at the time. So I said, raised my fist, looked at the crowd, said, center of the universe. <laughs> Boom. And wow. It was like a half a billion dollars worth of CGI for free. <laughs> anyway, the crowd completely freaked out. Right. And they told me later, because I asked, I said, what did that look like? He goes, it looked like you summoned lightning. Oh, my gosh. It looked exactly. And I was like, well, I could quit after this. <laughs> yeah, that's the that last show. We're the done. Best moment of my life. <laughs> like, what am I going to do to top it? Part the Red Sea? <laughs> yeah, yeah, seriously. What's the next date? <laughs> that is incredible, so man. So cool. And still to this day, people come up with, I remember the time you summoned the lightning from the sky. <laughs> Man, it doesn't get any better than that. You know, you, you mentioned preparing for the, you know, gearing up for dropping the, the record that's going to be coming yeah. out is that you sort of had an aversion to Zoom shows. You didn't want to, quote, panhandle to the Internet or do a live practice session. So can you talk to me yeah. about that? Yeah, you know, kind of for the reason I just explained about my feeling about live and playing live to me is, is, is uh, and probably to most people, it, it doesn't just involve people watching it involves people playing and uh, and watching in the same room in the space the smell or the heat or the lack of heat or whatever and the way that the, your ears compress when loud music hits it and i was too i was just too nervous about trying to pull that off just on video right you know, it wasn't because i was trying to be a dick or anything i was just like i don't know if we can, i don't know if we can get that same sensation Hmm. Live. Interesting. Maybe I would rather wait and just resume that sensation later um, rather than just just do that. I was nervous and the guys were nervous, too. We had just got off a, a really, really good tour, a like half of a tour, and we were all hot to play live. But then the idea of us just sitting in front of a, a, a camera and trying to pretend right. that we're playing live was kind of weird. So, I mean, I'll come up with something. You know, hopefully I can wait this COVID thing out so I won't have to get, you know, put to the task of actually yeah. doing it. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> not live. this isn't live. Mm -hmm. It must be, so, it is such a different sensation though, because you even mentioned like the smell in the room and stuff or the air of an outdoor show. These are things that people probably take for granted, but that's what the whole experience is. It is. And you know, and, and you know, from going to shows, like when you go see a band, it's not just the band. It's like what you see out of the corner of your eye, what people are right. there, what, uh, what the, the wall looks like and you kind of take in everything and that's the show and yeah. anything else is just basically a tv show yeah, right. I mean, a video a video show which is not the same thing not particularly bad and i guess if you were you know if you're like really good looking or you like to show off <laughs> you know you can pull it off but <laughs> depends on the artist look. maybe we're not that good looking <laughs> So I was like, I don't, I don't know if I want to do this. Maybe sometime in the future we'll come up with it. If it looks cool, if I can make it look cool enough, I'll do it. But at that point, I just felt like, eh, I think I want to save the surprise. Right, exactly. And, you know, running with the theme of doing something different and changing it up, A Better Dystopia, which comes out on Napalm Records on May 21st, is Monster Magnet's first covers record. So was that really important for you to have it be fully covers? Yeah, I figured if I was going to go, I've done covers in the past. And the main reason I wanted to do this this way was because I wanted to get a record out fast. And I didn't want to spend the lockdown basically on my phone or on my computer watching the world go crazy. Right. There was no sense in me watching everything go nuts, get all bummed out. No. You know, so I was like, this is, I knew it. You know, as soon as we got back from Europe, we, we got back from Europe. <clears throat> we got out of Milan two days before it hit Milan. Wow. So I knew it was coming, you know? Right. And we spent the last five days in Spain. And then two days after that, Spain fell and all those people started dying. So Man. when we got back, Man. Europe was like devastated. And, and I knew, I mean, even though America hadn't locked down yet, I was like, get ready. I told my family, you know, I was like, this is coming, man. Because you saw it in person. Yeah, we saw it in person. I was texting people that I knew from Italy two days after we played there that said their grandmother died. Wow. 
It was a trip. So the record was mixed and recorded in Bob Pantella's small but potent freak shop studios. I'm curious to know what was the scene like exactly in, in there in that uh, studio? Well, Bob's place is a uh, is awesome. And that's where we rehearse, you know, it's a rehearsal studio first. And he made it a small studio to make extra money when he's not touring. And uh, it's kind of like a clubhouse. It's a good, good place. Like what you'd want out of a rock and roll practice space. He's got a little bar in there and a TV in one little room. And then uh, his live room's cool, decorated with art and, you know, rugs on the floor, not like a studio at all. And a live room. It's where we practice. I never did a record there before because the gear wasn't good enough. But he upped his game. And because of the COVID thing, I thought I'd give it a shot and try to do the whole thing in there. Uh, just do it like like we're in the bunker. Because it was. It was like wartime. We had COVID and all this stuff. And I didn't want to be around too many people. So I figured we could, I would trust that we could trust the band. We'd just been together for a month. So we went in there with no masks and, you know, promised each other not to, not to go around the rest of the world and did it. And, um, yeah, so I co-produced it with Bob and it came out pretty cool for, for being in a little place. What's the metal scene like exactly in New Jersey? Because it seems to me like there's so many different groups coming out of New Jersey and so much metal music being made there. New Jersey's weird. It's like we're only like I'm only an hour from New York. But if you looked around, you would think you were 10,000 miles away. Right. There's a lot of people and they all run in their different little streams, like streams within streams, metal scene. Uh, what it would be, whatever you call alternative. And uh, there was punk for the longest time. And right now, I don't know what's going on in New Jersey because I spend most of my time like overseas. Right. Like, that's what, or, or, or touring the country. So, True. Uh, but the metal scene in New Jersey is hardcore and it's been going on forever. It's, it's pretty funny too. It's like there's a whole culture of these really long kind of dudes that look like me. Um, dudes that just seemed like they'd be coming out of, uh, out of dungeons and stuff, you know, <laughs> but they work at normal jobs. So the guy that delivers, you know, the guy that delivers sandwiches to 7-Eleven. Right. When he goes home, he like pulls out his ponytail and it's like this long. And all of a sudden he's like, I am Morgoth. Metal <laughs> Rock and roll. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's perfect. So, so it's really, it's, it's all encompassing in Jersey. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everybody tries everything. It's a really dense state. You know, it's like a lot of people per square inch. hundred percent. You know, another quote from you, which is really interesting is you, you, you've, you've made some parallels to the sixties and early seventies when one of the quotes you put was dystopia, apocalypse, revolution. And you feel like those words resonate then and now I'm curious about your perspective on that issue. Totally. I mean, it's, it's amazing how far we haven't got since I, when I was a kid. Hmm. So I was like a, like a kid coming to consciousness, um, you know, that age around 12 years old, when you start to look beyond what your parents are teaching you, right. Start to get stuff on your own. You're like, I saw this by myself. No one else saw it. I'm processing it. No one served it to me. And you start looking out of the corner of your eyes and you're reading stuff in magazines that you don't quite understand, but you're reading it anyway. And your mind starts to open and we could see you know, just on the on the front page of the papers, I could see what some of what my parents told me and that the country was going through all kinds of like civil war almost. Yeah. You know, there, you know, between 1965, I think 65 and 72, there was a riot in this country. Every single there were more than one riot, huge televised riot every single summer. Insane. Yeah. I mean, it's just way more than, than now. You know? Yeah. Um, so. It, it looked like, and we had the Vietnam War, and the kids looked crazy to the parents. The parents were like terrified because the kids looked nuts. Right. You know? It's like all these middle class white kids that were given all this stuff in the 50s and 60s that should have been like paying their parents back and going, oh, we're good boys. They were like freaks and running around. <laughs> that. Green hair. <laughs> right, right. And the black community was mad. You know, they were really, really angry. Everything was going on. And certain factions of these people were pulling together. Middle class mm -hmm. white kids were going in with the with the with the poor black kids in school. Um, sometimes fighting, sometimes not. More often not. 
and kind of fighting against what they thought was basically a bum deal. Right. You know, forgotten, like unkept promises. So what does that sound like? Sounds like so, now. <laughs> it really does sound like now. I, I couldn't believe it. It was like, I can't believe, you know, and I went down to a, there was an anti-Trump protest, like when he first got um, voted in. Mm -hmm. My whole town went berserk and like, this can't be. So we all met in the park and went crazy. Um, and I ran into this lady I went to school with, you know, she's all growing up now. She goes, I can't. And this was a, a, a common theme that I heard after it. She goes, I can't believe I'm still protesting this, this stuff. Wow. Still. Right. Because this is like a second lifetime of protest at that yeah. point. Well, you know what's something they made a lot of progress and then the progress slowly got stolen back. Hmm. You know what I mean? You, Absolutely. You a lot of cultural progress. People got a lot closer together than when I was a kid. But on the fringes, kind of off to the sidelines, under the radar, there are people who want to basically stop being fair. They don't mm. want to be fair to everyone. And, you know, it's like the, like I, like I was saying on the record, you know, at that time, the difference I see between the two times, the major difference in musically I saw was that in the last dystopia, when they were screaming apocalypse and dystopia and disaster, just like they are now, I thought the old one had a better soundtrack. Couldn't agree more, honestly. <laughs> I mean, hey, we were go talking the Beatles versus like mumble rap, you know. Yeah, I mean, you had, yeah, you had like the Beatles, Jimi Hendrix. Uh, I mean, insane. I mean, insane amount of music, and the music was coming out and sounded like the time we lived in. Right, right. You know what I mean, they were talking about stuff that was right in there. You just jump on it. The, the rock and rollers, rock people, and music people, rhythm and blues as well. They weren't afraid to, to take from them that modern feeling, even if it was paranoid and weird, and put it in their pop song. Right. I think what we got now is a bunch of people that are a little bit like, I don't know if I really want to go too far out on the edge because of my career. Mm -hmm. And there's a bunch of different things going on that weren't going on back then. What one is rock and roll and and that old rock spirit is now kind of grown up. And it just, a lot of people depended on it for their only living and they have kids and whatever, for whatever reason, they didn't jump in right. on it. You know, like I, I thought, I thought when Trump got elected that every kid in America was going to lose their shit and mm -hmm. write protest songs, but they didn't. Right. Well, that being said, do you think that could come? Do you think there could be like a creative renaissance, so to speak? It's always possible. I'm always ready, man. Cause I'm, you know, I mean, I love old music and I play the music from my childhood and I hold it dear to my, cause I think it's a big hard rock. And psychedelia is a, is a justifiably um, magnificent part of music. Yeah. And I always hold it, but I, I'm also a rock and roll fan. I want the next big thing. Right. You know, give it to me. Like I want to get surprised. Um, but right now it looks as I think there's a renaissance, there could be a renaissance coming, but right now, what we saw and what we're seeing is a renaissance of personality, not necessarily of art. Interesting. Right. Modern kids are their own stars to a certain effect. They don't have to look to art all the time to get the answers. They think that they're their own answers. And in a lot of ways, they're mimicking stuff from the past. Like the 20th century taught us that people on magazine covers and people with their own, their own gigs we're cool. So now what does everybody have? They have their own Instagram. They have their own Facebook. Their own, right. They do their own thing. And like, here I am. My name is Joe Blow from Idaho. And I'm the shit. I'm the coolest guy in the world. Here's my favorite song. It's like music is still there, but it's not like front and center art anymore. It's like, here's me. Here's what I have to say. And here's what I like. It's personality based. Personality based and word based more than anything else. Right. And but he's talking at the same time. Mm -hmm. which, so it's hard to tell what's noise and what's not. Absolutely. And uh, as, as you, I mean, anybody knows, um, I, I, I think art, I think most people know this, art takes a little time to grow on people. Yeah. Uh, to be interpreted. 
And I think that while there's a lot of art being made these days from a bunch of different people, I don't think the mass people are taking the time to interpret it one way or the other because they're so busy talking to each other. Right. Just about whatever. Because people seem like people just want to watch each other talk about, about, you know. what, about whatever, which is right. not necessarily a bad thing. But if you ask me, I would say, hey, shut up a minute. <laughs> Let people create cool stuff, you know. Like Zappa, shut up and play your guitar. I think we need some of that back in the world. I, I have to agree, man, because, I mean, look at the results. If you look at the results from the, uh, the late 20th century and the early 21st century, I mean, the art, art-wise, the late 20th century has a beat. I mean, technology-wise... The 21st century has to be, but who cares about technology if it's not going to make for better art? If it's just going to make for mm. a big argument, then I'm like, Truth. so we'll have to wait and see. That's a fantastic point, you know, that, and I think that's really interesting. I'm curious to see what the listeners have to say about that one. Uh, you know, speaking of the record that's coming out of Better Dystopia, the cover album, it opens with The Diamond Mind, with you reciting a classic monologue by Dave Diamond, who's, who was an American radio DJ who really helped popularize psychedelic rock. Is that is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean, I, I think he was California only, but like, I don't know if he went out all over the country, but he totally pushed the psychedelic thing when it was just beginning. And um, his monologue is like one of my favorite. It's just totally insane. Yeah. It's like, oh, mine. Um, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense, but everything has got the, the most psychedelic angle to it at all. He's talking about trees growing fur, you know, he's talking <laughs> about a fur lined volcano. He's crying out to God. He's, he sounds like a mad preacher for psychedelics, but if that preacher was a cop, he sounds really straight. He sounds like like the guy on Dragnet, you know, Joe Friday, the guy on Dragnet. Right. <clears throat> it really, really got me when I first heard that because it was just so funny and enthusiastic at the same time. What's your favorite label for the type of music that you make? Because you hear, you know, psychedelic rock, stoner rock, acid music. What's your favorite label or is there one? Well, I'll, I'll take them all because, you know, labels are, labels are funny. Labels are for, <clears throat> are for people that are listening. They're not really for the people that are making them. Right. You know, I've never known anyone who made music that was happy with a label. That's a good but point. People who listen to them love labels because it's fun. And it's a little bit stoner. It's a little bit acid rock, but maybe there's a little Martin Fluff Fly in there. Like, <laughs> blah, blah. I just made that up today. Yeah, that's, that's a new subcategory. Fun. A little flop flop psychedelic <laughs> with a little euro tinge, but there's just a, a, you know a couple notes of uh, Miles Davis jazz in there, and it's like, dude, it's just rock. So right, I call I always called myself a psychedelic hard rock band, meaning mm -hmm. at any point I can emphasize either parts of those. I could emphasize the psychedelic, or I could emphasize the hard, or I could emphasize the rock. That way. I'm covered. Interesting. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. So Dave, in closing, what can people expect from a better dystopia and what's the track that you're the most excited about that you covered? Um, well, what they can expect is, is probably about 45 minutes of, of uh, a slightly different dimension than what we have now. Mm -hmm. um, I tried really hard to make this record sound really cool and also really different than what's currently available by modern rock bands. Yeah. You know, it sounds older, mm -hmm. but it doesn't sound ancient. Fidelity is good. And I want, you know, I would like to think that people would put on this record and go, oh yeah, there's that sound. Yeah. This, these guys got a sound and it's current throughout the record. And um, it's also, it, like I said, it, it's kind of paranoid and enthusiastic and very colorful and interesting. That's what I would like people to go go like, yeah, you know, I feel like hearing that that Monster Mind record. You know, yeah, I want to get into that and look at the cover and go, oh yeah, the, boy, this, this music sounds like the cover looks. Yeah, and which is important too. Is it difficult to have your signature sound when you're covering songs? Because you guys did an incredible job of it. I mean, it was really intense. I picked the right songs to do it with. That's right. what it was. I mean, if I start, if I was started picking. Uh, you know, you two songs, I'd be in trouble. You know? Right. Hey, why don't we cover, you know, 
uh, it wouldn't work. So I, I was very careful to pick the kind of songs that inspired me when I was young. And I knew I had the heart to pull it off, you know, and then produce it the right way. So you get that sound. Um, Absolutely. The record. The songs, Go ahead. Sorry. Songs, I'm sorry. All the songs are record. I love I, I can't pick a quite favorite, but I really like doing, um, uh, there's a song called, uh, uh, be forewarned, mm -hmm. which is a, really old ancient song it's sung in this style that people don't sing anymore uh, that it's old it's blues based by pentagram but yeah it was by pentagram yeah, yeah. their band before pentagram was called the macabre and oh. guys used to sing back then in this kind of overblown way that's corny but very effective and i was just dying to sing that song because Nobody sings like that anymore. It's so yeah. cool. <laughs> it's killer. Yeah, I, I, it's a style reminiscent of, you know, a, a certain moment in time. Absolutely. Yeah. And it went and it's like, there's still plenty of good singers around, but nobody sings quite like that. It's weird how not only sounds change over time, but methods of singing. Right. That's true, too. You definitely you hear it go with time, especially if, if the category of music. Yeah, and, and, and I think that's mainly not because people don't want to sing that, but they just get out of practice. Yeah, that's the thing. You got to keep it moving. Man, this has been an incredible conversation, Dave. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me, and I want to let everybody know that the record, A Better Dystopia, is coming out May 21st on Napalm Records, the first cover album by Monster Magnet, and it kicks absolute ass. So everybody uh go check it out. Thanks, Cassius. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. What a treat having Dave on the show. I mean, that guy's really something else. Yeah, I've been following them since the early 90s when I, I, I first heard them. And I thought, what a different sound. I'd never heard this kind of like stoner rock. Like you were saying, right? The labels, right? Stoner rock. I'd never really heard that. But I like their vibe. Uh, unique vocal, right? Unique sound and mm -hmm. very like just straight ahead rock. Almost, a, you know, ACDC-ish at the time. Black Sabbath, of course, right? Like, Definitely. So it caught my ear back then. And then I sort of fell off the radar for me. I always knew of them and, you know, heard stuff that they were doing. But uh, I enjoyed this uh, covers album in the sense, like uh, so many artists, obviously, I do not know. I'd never heard of some of these songs. I never heard of it. Like, it's, it's a genre right, right. that I've never really dived deep, deep into the whole culture. They went really deep for the covers. Absolutely. That's it, right? So, and it, it was cool. And I find like when people, when bands do like, like, when I really got into Metallica in like uh, the Master of Puppet era, and they came out with that covers album, Garage uh, Band. Uh, well, not Garage Band. Garage Inc. Like, yeah, Garage Inc. You know, and there were so many songs. Obviously, I'd never heard of those songs either. But I find when like a a more modern band does good, legitimate covers of older songs, I find it's easier to digest for a younger audience. So it's like, it's, you know, that first way in, you're like, oh, okay, this sounds better produced. It sounds more like today's music. Whereas sometimes I find the sound blocks you. When stuff sounds old, sometimes mm -hmm. it's like, I don't know. It sounds a bit like uh, cringy or different. But then once you get past that cover, then all of a sudden everything is like, wow, just listen. Everything's a whole new world. You could deep dive into 40 years of an artist's career. That's what's amazing, you know? No, I mean, that's a good point. The music can be solid, but maybe the production can be holding it back. Like a lot of the Kiss records, the early Kiss records before they did their live album, that's, that's the it. case. And even they say that. That's why they went live and they brought the sound to life, the production. And then it was the same songs, but then they became hits from different being differently produced um really but was this was this monster magnet album a full cover album yeah yeah this one was it's funny we have a cover theme on today's episode we have la rats monster yeah. magnet and then we just talked about the other cover there this is all covers today but i feel like <laughs> yeah. wait wait so if we were to just take a step back here and we're like what's your guys overall takes on bands doing covers like isn't that kind of a isn't that a, a topic of discussion in music? Like, oh, in, yeah, exactly, Joe. There, Absolutely, it is a topic, yeah. yes. Yeah, of yeah, course. Like, what, what, I mean, and to have a full album based around that, it's like, hmm, interesting. Yeah, but I mean, as like, you know, I, I could be snob sometimes and I think it's like, oh, you know, again, you're just releasing a cover and then it's like yeah. just to get more success. But like when artists come out right away with a cover, that's what kind of sort of bothers me. You know, it's kind of like an easy 
oh, let's hook the audience, you know? Right. Uh, hmm. But these I just want to make this like, clear. You know, I'm like, not trying to to no, no. throw shade at Monster Magnum. I, I know their, their, their album is terrific. It's just like I hear that conversation being thrown around, whether it's on Twitter or in news articles. It's like, oh, or just speaking with you guys. It's like, oh, wow, it was, it was just a cover. I feel like yeah. I'd like to see more individuality from artists who have skill. No, yeah, that's, that's, that's a really good point. That's yeah. what I was going to say, like to, to their credit and artists like these that do full album covers or decide to, let's say, let's do one off album cover. They're still touring. They're still writing new albums. They're still active. So it's, it's cooler. It's not like, oh, we're just doing a covers tour, a covers album just to kind of like uh, cash in a bit again, you know, or something. Yeah. The interesting part about it for, from where I'm sitting is like, for example, Frank, Ace Fraley from Kiss, he was often criticized through his whole career because his first hit single new york groove was actually a cover but it was a cover of a song that people didn't know the original okay. so everybody thinks that that's an ace song but some purists criticize him for that um and he's continued to do it throughout his career and even to, to bring it more to current music um because we're about to touch on this artist a lot of the drake songs that are popularized are very very edited chopped up versions of very popular songs and there's a lot of drake tracks where where being a young kid, like listening to him, I thought he wrote this stuff and it turns out he was using stuff from other artists. So again, a lot of people are like, whoa, like, you know, you're taking credit for this. So yeah, it's a, it's a weird, I, I would actually like well, to maybe do a poll for the It is audience. almost though, like, I know we're going off on a little tangent here, but it is almost, when done well, it is yeah. almost like an entirely different song. But that's what I was going to say. Like, mm -hmm. look at Daft right. Punk, right? Like so many of those are lifted off, samples lifted off funk albums, disco albums. That yeah, they yeah. just and then they just did their own vocals and a whole revive. So it's kind of like it's interesting, you know. It's it's a cover, but yet it's also they added their thing to it. So it's not really a cover, you know. Like I don't know if you guys watched that that new hit Netflix show uh, Bridgerton. Have you ever at least heard of it? Yes, Nothing. I've heard of it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. At least heard of it. Yeah. Like <clears throat> obviously set in like 1800s England, a bit like romanticized. Fake, like it's not a, a real life simulation of what England was in the 18th, 19th century, but like the, the music, which you'd expect being, you know, renaissance or post-Renaissance, like after 1800 music, it was just covers of Ariana Grande. In a, really? in a Weird. show set in the 1800s, but it worked. It freaking worked. And, and it, you know, <laughs> so sometimes just to continue this point, maybe but, finalize it, it's, it's like covers, even though it's already a song that's being recycled in a way, it's, it's almost like an entirely different song and can, it could fit. Anyways, it, they they sound good sometimes, you know but, uh, what I'm trying to say. I love on the that. Bridgerton, on the Bridgerton, was it straight up Ariana Grande songs? No, or but it was it was done. The, hmm. ah, it was that, it was that, rearranged and re so redone to fit 18th yeah, century. Exactly. Music. So that's okay because it fits in because it's uh, I don't know what the word expression is for it. It's like of the time, right? Kind of right. thing. It's right with exactly. the instrumentation of the time. It's not a, a Les Paul blaring through a Marshall no, no. in an 1800s thing, which could be artsy. I'm sure someone can make it work. Yeah. You know? Hey, Django Unchained. They had Django you know Unchained. the modern exactly. music and stuff. That was pretty I love cool. That clash. But like, you know, exactly. <laughs> yeah. We so could go on all works, day man. about this. Sometimes it yeah, works. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I got to stop myself because I have so many other uh, points yeah, on know, this I'd like to bring up, but I would yeah. like to see the audience comment. Tell us what you think about any of this. We actually really like to see you guys' comments about this part of the show. And what we're yeah. going to do is if you keep leaving more comments, we'll start reading them on the air and then we'll start interacting with them. So definitely shout out. Yes, uh, that's something we want to do, man. That's something we want to do. If you if you guys are still listening, like give us a thought about something, someone or some band who did a cover that's either you liked, you didn't, and we can discuss it. Absolutely. So now we're taking it from the 1800s back to present day. Now we're really okay. covering the full scope here on this episode. Um, this weekend, one of the music uh, events that happened was the Billboard Awards, the 2021 Awards. Now, I don't know how much of this you guys caught, but there were some pretty big victories just to bring people up to speed who didn't watch, for Canada especially. Uh, Drake mm. won the Artist of the Decade, and he won two different awards. Uh, the Weeknd won Top Artist, Top Male Artist. He took home about 10 awards the other night, guys. I mean, yeah. our country cleaned <laughs> up at these awards. It was insane. It's it's interesting. Like, I kind of, I don't know how I feel about, like, where you see, like, a guy like The Weeknd, deservedly, everything, I get it. But, like, when you see it's, like, Top male artist, top uh, R&B artist, top male R&B artist. 
Like, okay. You <laughs> yeah. Know, it's like, it's top it's, male R&B yeah, artist with that. the microphone. Top. <laughs> yeah. You know what I, mean? like, I mean, I love the guy. Like, I love the video that he did. The performance was really cool in the parking lot with like a bunch of cars. Very uh, cool. I like the, his Super Bowl thing. And like he pu- paid out of his pocket to get a lot of that stuff done, you know? And mm-hmm. so much respect to that guy, you know? And, but it's, it's just interesting how many times, you know, okay, pop male artist, pop male artist, pop male artist that started with this word or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> you know, like, no, I get it. I get that. Uh, yeah. Canada, I feel like that's. I feel uh, yeah, it's a lot. I feel like, I feel like um, it, it's something that Canada Canadians should hold col- close to their heart. At least music Canadian music fans, because like, you know, especially like American oriented award shows, you don't think of of others aside from American artists sweeping home or, or ro- riding away into to. the sunset with these awards. Exactly. Also, not just Canada, BTS. Uh, oh my cleaned gosh. Up shop. Right? Yes. Like crazy BTS, good a too. lot of Latin artists that I'd never heard of or never That's seen. It. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. What, what, what was I going to say here? It, a Bad Bunny, right? Top Latin album. Bad Bunny was there. And you, yep. you, you see a lot of these Latin American artists who are just rising the charts in America because people just, especially during the summer, people just love these like South American, Latin American vibes. Um, just to name a few Bad Bunny, Rosalia. Uh, Justin Aquiles, I think his name is. Uh, wait, there's one more that's off the top of my. Anyway, so Dua Lipa. So, Dua Lipa, Dua Lipa yeah, but, and but uh, J, always, J Balvin. J Balvin. But Latin's always mm. been huge. It's always been big. Huge. Yeah, always. Yeah. It's true. In, in the last, let's say, 20, 40 years, probably, it's always been huge. But it's, it, it's 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 interesting to see how they've evolved over the years exactly. with Latin music, yet still keeping it super pop or like hip hop or with trap and stuff. And the same thing with BTS, you know, like, yeah, of course they took away so many. And I noticed it just with my kids, like, you know, they'll listen to Arabic trap songs, you know, they'll listen to Mm -hmm. different, uh, many different things. So it's, it's I've heard some of that too. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a great thing. And and I also think it's a commentary on where the business is going. Cause we've talked with artists on inner sleeve about K-pop and the way that it's, it's, you know, dominating. I mean, correct. You know, I'm sure it has probably happened, but I've never seen also people come up and accepting awards at an American award show, speaking Spanish fully without any translation. Like I've never really seen that. You know what I mean? So it feels like there's in America, they're really just about at the point where it's completely mainstream to hear other languages Mm -hmm. on radio, on TV. And I'm very curious to see if Canada will embrace that late or if they will embrace that on time, because oftentimes we can be late with trends here and there. You never know. Um, but yeah, I'd like yeah, to hear often, maybe some we, more. We often mimic what happens down south. I mean, whatever, you know, like right. not, not every artist will translate well, but I mean, in general, we're pretty much a mirror of what's going on over there. Yeah, that's fair. Exactly. Another, another note that we wanted to talk on, a touch upon more on the Billboard Awards was uh, just Taylor Swift's reign of like female artistry. She's always just winning these type of awards, but her like work ethic is off the charts. You think of other female artists who are always in the spotlight too, like it, next side by side to her. You think of Lady Gaga, you think of Pink, you think newer ones like Halsey and even, yeah, like Halsey's rising up now. She's real popular, Megan Thee Stallion, yeah. Cardi B, but like Taylor Swift's been literally like a workhorse for the past, what, decade, maybe more? No, it's more. true. She'll probably win more. an award herself for artist of of something. You know what I mean? Because it's true. Even look yeah. at Nicki Minaj. I mean, she just dropped her album. She's arguably, yeah, Nicki. you know, just as a stab, established or maybe more, but it did not hit the way that Taylor hits. And, you know, personally with me and Taylor Swift, like I'm not a fan. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I don't see the appeal. It For me, it shows, you know, she has some pretty vindictive lyrics. But again, it's it's not written for me. So that that makes sense too. The people that they're writing it for are liking it. Yeah, exactly. I have a lot of I have a lot of I've similar as well. I don't go out and listen to a Taylor Swift song. I've heard some, obviously, and I like some. Uh, but I have nothing but respect for that girl, man. Like in terms, like you said, just the the work ethic and even what she's been through. Like you know, the award being ripped off of her, like in the middle of like accepting an award, uh, the whole publishing deal with her labels and not being able to re-record her songs and all that stuff. And even when Apple, this you know, back a couple years back, and Apple and the streaming services were saying the first three months for free for people, but then no royalties will be paid to the artist. Well, she freaking stood up and said, "Well, am I mm, taking my music that's true. off?" And they. They went back on that, you know? So that's like, come on, man. That's really, that's something That's else. big stuff. Yeah, that's that's yeah, major yeah. stuff. Man, yeah, definitely. Maybe I earned some respect for Taylor Swift in this episode. I didn't see this one coming, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> definitely but, cool. No, it's it's a testament to her work ethic, I think, true. It's <laughs> like, yeah, her, not yeah. everyone's music is made for everyone, but man, she's just hitting the right buttons like all the time. Super consistent, like like a, like a, the Justin Bieber, but, you know, for, for female artists, like just 
always relevant for so long, just constantly, you know, producing bangers. Speaking and, of, uh, uh, of yeah. Bieber, did he win anything? Did he get anything? I, I don't believe he won. He was there. Was he? I didn't see him there. Um, but what? it's very interesting to see his his comeback, so to speak. Yeah, agreed. JB much, much, much more yeah. mature. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a different. He's a completely different artist than even like maybe three, four, or five years ago. It's it's crazy. He's completely different. But I, I, not to say I, I enjoy his music that he's producing too. Another guy that I want to talk to you guys about, and maybe Joe. This is weird. This is a good topic to have on this channel. I feel like because this channel, at least the show itself and uh, the way this show has been received and kind of produced, it's it's much more rock oriented. I think it's safe to say. Yeah. And and not to say that the channel is strictly rock. There's obviously different genres, but a lot of it is rock as well. I want to I want to hear you guys take on Machine Gun Kelly winning top rock artist. I feel mm. like many people don't. Um, associate Machine Gun Kelly, I, I, and if you guys don't know about Machine Gun Kelly, that's fine. Like, I, he's one I of do. The, like I one do. of the artists I know something about. Oddly enough, like I don't know anything about artists, but some I know a bit about him. Is that he started off like super like heavy rap ish? Like I, I know his first yeah. like major album was Lace Up, and that was just like you'd think like a a, a white guy rapper, like a heavy rapper. Um, mm -hmm. But he's kind of like transitioned his career, and he's also like. To give full credit to him, multi instrumentalist like drums, guitar, uh, yep. really into cl like classic rock and motivated by by the you know the founding fathers, but never thought of at least on my end to be known for rock. But over the past few years and his latest album, feel like felt like I was brought back to like year two thousand. Hmm. What crazy. do you think, Joe? I, I want to like hear your heavy? thoughts. Well, I don't know much. Uh, in turn, I didn't listen to the song, but I did see it when I was doing some research. I heard the song, and it sounded like a well-produced guitar rock song. Yeah. Uh, but it sounded more poppy rock. I mean, like, you know, now we're really splitting hairs here, you know, like, if yeah, you want to yeah, start yeah. getting into that stuff. But, I mean, I don't know enough to say. I haven't heard his album, so I really don't want to say anything. That no, I, no, that's that's fine. It's just interesting because, you. like, why, are, why aren't... Who's a, who's a modern-day rock... Why aren't rock bands to their core winning these event these awards? Like, wh what's the deal? Why aren't they in the spotlight as much? Honestly, fr from what, from mm. yeah, I, I think that it's one of those situations where like there are certain bands who have the market who will pretty much have it forever, like Metallica, ACDC. Yeah, and there's pretty much no benefit in pushing them from a corporate standpoint because like they're not making those companies any money, really. They have their own stuff. They'll do their own 60,000 fans. And it's like, it's not really feeding the machine in the same way. Like for, for me, these awards are an award for who makes the business the most money, not who makes the best music. So it's like, yeah, you did the most for us. We will recognize you. Um, so yeah, that I think that that's always a weird distinction. But Machine Gun Kelly too, great that you brought him up. Yesterday I was telling somebody talking to somebody and we, i was like man the way he came up i mean he was sort of like a goofy rapper yeah. almost uh then he went up against eminem had a yep. major that was what, two years ago three years ago maybe a yeah. couple of years ago and and in a lot of people's eyes was like done at that point now he's bounced back he was in the motley crew movie he portrayed tommy lee Did he's dating job. megan fox <laughs> it's like so i think he, i'm like you know what man it's cool to see somebody that it feels like the whole world or a lot of the world was against them and they just continue to rise and rise and rise so sh hats off to machine gun Kelly. yeah and also like a guy who doesn't brag or sorry no he does brag about where he comes from but it's not like one of those oh i'm from la la groomed me no he's like no thank you to to uh to ohio for raising a, a badass dude you know like gritty <laughs> exactly. ohio you know you don't think of artists coming out of ohio but hey so what <laughs> exactly. about uh, our buddy drake artist of the decade oh, well, i mean come on you know i saw that you know i saw that uh, and i'm just like huge like if i were ever to be, be given an award that's just like top artist what was it of the decade yeah top mm -hmm. artist of the decade that's a lot of weight man that's freaking heavy and you know we mentioned some big artists at the top of this conversation the weekend taylor swift uh you know we mentioned lady gaga these people who have been at the top of their games for well as long as drake has but drake is just like we're talking about work ethic we're talking about making the most money. We're talking about hitting the right markets to to satisfy the the needs of the people who like it. He's just hit check mark, check mark, check mark all the time. Every time, man. I liked the uh, the when they were announced when he they announced them in like the the intro video. Mm -hmm. and it's like you know that he played and people are saying like uh, it doesn't make sense or it's not going to happen or all this stuff. And he just like yeah. he just said check mark next one, next one, next one. Exactly. I mean, 
for me, I'm obviously on the sidelines, like watching this happen all this time. And like, and it's, it's, I love it. I love the story, man. I love the fact that it's like, yeah, you think I'm whatever, whatever, whatever. Just keep going. Just keep going, you know? And like, exactly. Meanwhile, next thing you know, you're like <laughs> on top of the world, the most streamed artist, like literally it's ever. It's crazy. You know, he, he actually surpassed the Beatles and, and this may not make a lot of people like him uh, more. And I don't, I don't necessarily like this, but he actually has a tattoo on his arm that's like you know you know when they show the evolutionary chart hu monkey into human it shows the four beetles and uh. then him in front of them waving bye-bye as he surpasses them <laughs> so i'm just like this motherfucker this dude's got some audacity man yeah. but it's like think about it he does have more songs sold than the beatles which isn't really fair because they didn't have spotify and they weren't around yeah, for yeah. as long and all yeah, this stuff global streaming didn't exist like exactly but yeah. i i just I, I felt so proud because like frank like you're obviously a sports guy and like joe i think you you like the hockey to a degree you know like when when my team wins in my city like i'm happy but i don't really like feel like i take ownership or like we did it like i, I don't know i'm not really into it on that level but with music with drake and the weekend i really felt like our country won and i just i just really felt mm. proud of the fact that there's kids sitting in their room telling themselves i could never do it because i'm from canada or i could never do it because i look like this or because i'm like that or whatever True. and they may reconsider now and i think that that's just like that's bigger than any sales figure any tour anything like so yeah i, I really appreciate those guys and what they did and shout out to the weekend too i mean crazy crazy yep. stuff yeah, so yeah. I don't, like, definitely a good performance and awards and it's like and every time you see them like, oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah yeah, yeah of course too. there oh, they yeah. are yeah like, it's like, holy jeez <laughs> take my money <laughs> legendary <laughs> Well, I think that was a good recap. I don't know if you guys had any additional thoughts, but... Uh, I, honestly, what I'd just like to see is like starting a new wave in the comments. Like I want to see people engage with us. We've seen it a bit over the past few weeks with Miles Kennedy episode and, and, and whatnot, but like I want to see more of you guys just give us your random thoughts, even if it's maybe something that's controversial, controversial or agrees with what we're saying. I just want to see you guys out there in the comments section um, because I feel like we've got something special brewing here. We've got another... What? three three weeks of great interviews coming your way with very Absolutely. unique artists very unique artists people that you won't expect uh, on the show and Cassius just brings the best out of them so uh look we've got a, a great lineup coming please mm -hmm. show us you're there in the comments show us just anything um we always respond right joe's the best with that stuff so anyways we're, we're here <laughs> for you guys that's that's it that's what i want to say you wow. respond joe i'll respond Thanks okay well we, we we have your <laughs> yeah, we have your word yeah i don't think i need to do an outro frank's got it this guy's gonna Seriously. take my job in a minute <laughs> we appreciate you guys checking us out and of course make sure to click that subscribe button we don't want you guys to miss any of this content as frank said we have so much coming and it's it is really exciting so click the subscribe button whether you're tuned in on apple Podcasts, spotify of course right here on our home at youtube and click the notification bell next to the subscribe button so that you get a proper alert whenever we upload and you get it right right away advanced copy so to speak it's perfect also check out all the links in the description it's going to send you to our social media it's going to give you monster magnets latest record which we encourage you to go get and of course thanks as always for listening to this episode of inner sleeve on sound mojo